Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Take 30. Um, we're going to be talking about AWS Glue and AWS Redshift today. What, what we're going to do is we're going to go through some quick definitions, do a rundown on features and costs for both, uh, and then we'll uh, end with a Q&A. Ironside, quick, quick background on us. So we're an AI data strategy and analytics firm. We've been around for two decades. Um, we're a technology company, but we don't we don't go one size for one size fits most solutions. We look at tools, we look at approaches with each unique customer, and we we try to find solutions according uh, to need. Um, we run the full data lifecycle at Ironside. We do quick checkups, we do long term engagement. We might do one or more of the pie slices that you're seeing now, or sometimes just the ingredient, maybe the whole loop. Um, so, you know, we could do upgrades, just take a few days, or for others, we'll do full build and, and multi-year engagement. And we have a lot of tools at our disposal, a lot of great partnerships at Ironside. Uh, the punk, if you go on the next, that's great. Um, today, we'll look at a couple in the AWS category, Blue and Redshift. But um, first, we'll do some quick introductions on myself and my partner um, for this particular Take 30. Um, my name is Dean Reinhardt. I've been in data warehousing for 20 years, IT for 25. I've run the gamut of all data roles. I've been an analyst, an ETL developer, architect, IT management, and I've run through telecommunications industry to energy to finance. And uh, I've been consulting for the past seven years. Um, I'd like to introduce the punker, and he'll start off with his introduction and get away to the glue. All right, uh, thank you, Dean. Um, my name is Dipankar Dasgupta, and uh, I've been with uh, Ironside for two years now, but I have over uh, 20 years experience in information technology, especially in uh, data management, data quality, data integration, and various uh, data, wa data warehouses and databases. I am also an AWS certified professional. So before we uh, jump onto our topic of Glue and Redshift today, I wanted to uh, show you this uh, visual wherein we have this classic AWS architecture of cloud data warehousing. And as you know, in a data warehousing implementation, you have various sources that you kind of bring in into a staging area or uh, what commonly we see right now is a data lakes where data is kind of brought in, aggregated into one single location. In case of S3, typically it's kind of S3, which serves as a storage. And then we use some kind of an ETL tool to move the data into your further uh, data warehousing tools and databases, which in this case, we'll talk more about Redshift as well. But as you can see here, uh, we have used Glue as the and one of the ETL tool in this AWS implementation of Data Warehouse. But you also have on the top uh, the DMS, which is data management service from AWS, which helps in bringing over the whole database and bring it over to S3 or other databases. So this is a kind of a typical architecture diagram. So on to our main topic, what um, one of those is Glue. So what is Glue? A high level overview is like Glue is a fully managed extract transform load, which is an ETL service, which you all know. And it helps you to load data into various data sources for your analytics. It connects the data sources from your management console, the AWS management console, which uh, is pretty easy. And Glue has this data catalog feature which serves as a central repository and stores all your table and schema definitions uh, via the crawler. And uh, it, since it's an AWS service itself, it natively supports various data stores and service integrates with various AWS services itself. And uh, it uh, connects with various data sources like Amazon Aurora, uh, commonly used databases in RDSs, as well as other databases which are hosted in your EC2 instances. 
And obviously it uh, connects with uh, S3 as you have seen before. So like um, a typical ETL tool, um, it helps you monitor schedule jobs to see the status. And if you integrate with uh, and another S S AWS service, SNS, simple notification service, you can get those job failures notification for success or failure. And uh, it obviously everybody is concerned with security when you go in the cloud, so it's secure both at rest as well as supports SSL for data in motion or transit. So what I feel about Glue is it's uh, three different uh, areas what it uh, differentiates from others is it is serverless, so you do not have to provision infrastructure. You, it is uh, basically uh, has a schema inference which uh, goes, crawls into your data stores which you connect to and can bring the uh, latest definitions of the tables and any table changes it has and maintains in that central repository. And it has also this auto generation of ETL scripts, which are mostly in uh, Scala or Python. So you can take those ETL scripts that are generated and customize it to your needs as per the transformations and the business case. So uh, everybody is also concerned about uh, the pricing. How much would it cost me if I were to go in the cloud? And since AWS is serverless, you do not have to be concerned about provisioning of the resources. And it does not like, uh, it brings up the resources. So you do not, uh, AWS does not charge for the time it takes to provision those resources, but only for the time that the ETL job or the crawler job runs. So there are, mostly the two different kinds, crawler or ETL jobs that you pay an hourly rate, built by the closest second and are rounded up to at least a minimum of 10 minutes. And also you have the other tier, which is the, the data catalog where in you pay a monthly fee, but there is a generous 1 million catalogs or data stores that tables that you can store and 1 million requests that is under, comes under the free category. So the free tier is 1 million storage, 1 million of request. And if you are under that, you do not have to pay anything. So it costs you $0 on that. So below you'll see two tables, which are mostly have drawn up some use cases, something that I already spoke about, but just wanted to give you a quick example here. Uh, Typical DPU cost about 44 cents, and it does vary with the region, but typically in um, US East, North Virginia region, it's uh, 44 cents. And so for example, if you are running a ETL job which consumes six DPUs, runs for 10 minutes, you do the math here, it's 44 cents. And so if you are running those in a batch oriented mode like seven days a week, it runs two times a day maybe, it will cost you for the whole year. This is the cost of $320 for the whole year, which is pretty generous. And uh, similarly for data catalogs on the right as well, you will see like uh, first million dollars of request and storage is free. But if you go over that limit, you can do a similar math as like what we saw here. And uh, if let's say the glue crawler runs for three times a week for the whole year, it'll cost you $293. So you can see it's pretty generous in what it gives you for the free tier as well as it costs very less. Dipankar, we have a question on that slide. Um... Oh, sure. So on the left for glue it, you know, six DPU runs, like how much is that? Is that like a big warehouse, a small warehouse? How much will that, will that handle? So, uh, I mean, how much it will handle, that's kind of uh, something that it cannot be answered straight, but, uh, but glue, for example, has typically assigns uh, 10 DPUs when it runs uh, Spark 
uh, Apache Spark jobs. And uh, there are monitors that you can uh, look into the AWS console, Blue console, and see if the DPUs that have been assigned is working or is if it is not giving the throughput that you would need, then you can increase, or if you have over provision, you can decrease the DPUs. But by default, it uh, for a uh, for us, Apache Spark, it would assign 10 DPUs by default, and you can increase or decrease based on your needs. So did that answer the question? Yeah, I think so, thank you. All right, so moving on. Um, so uh, I wanted to come kind of uh, show a couple of use cases that uh, Glue has, and we all know like uh, there are we know a ETL tool as moving data from point A or a data store to another data store or a data warehouse or S3. But uh, I wanted to talk about mostly the, the data catalog feature wherein the crawler can connect to data source. So on the top, you will see here the Amazon S3, which if you connect your AWS view, and it crawls your uh, S3 and brings in all the schema table definitions that are there and puts it into the central repository. And this is now available for your uh, downstream applications or services like Redshift, EMR, uh, even you can read those through Amazon Athena or bring it to run your reports in several other BI applications. So it's kind of one here, but also you can see that you can aggregate your data from various sources, which is here like Amazon Redshift, uh, S3, RDSs, various EC2 and other sources, and you can connect to those data sources. Group crawler will crawl those all those data sources, bring those together into a central repository, and can expose those uh, that central repository to other downstream applications and your reports. So that's kind of a high level. I mean, we can talk more about other use cases, but uh, that's it for sake of time. Just one other question here um, that came in. Can Glue handle streaming data? Oh, okay, yeah, uh, yep. Uh, that's uh, a glue uh, uh, has a very recent uh, uh, feature that it can also ingest uh, the streaming through serverless. It's called the serverless streaming, where it can connect to uh, Kinesis, Amazon Kinesis, or Apache Kafka, and bring in your data and process it on the fly in real time and load it to various other sources, data stores, like whether it's a database S3 where you would like to do your analytics. And also you can use that serverless streaming to use it for other events like IoT events and all that. So yeah, it is a, a new feature, but it is definitely available and easy to kind of implement. Great, thank you. All right, uh, next, before we switch to the next topic, I would like uh, Debbie to put up the poll that we have for today. All right, uh, so while the poll is on, uh, we'll have our next speaker, Dean, who will going to cover topics on uh, Redshift. But uh, as you have been uh, kind of already know, like you have throwing questions out there, so you can write in the chat box and one of the panelists will answer that question. So, but do answer or answer the poll. So that would be great. All right. So, yeah, so it looks like um, most people are in a fairly early stage, either still just talking implementation vendors or have a little bit um, up and running, which is good. So, um, and, and just a lot of cloud movement yet to go. Excellent. Thank you very much. So let's uh, let's move to uh, from from the ETL to the actual data warehouse and talk about Redshift. 
Um, Amazon Redshift is a fully managed petabyte scale uh, warehouse service in the cloud. And fully managed means Redshift does all the back end work for you. Setup, management, scaling of the database, monitoring, backing up your data clusters, um, downloading, installing updates, and other you know minor upkeep tasks. So it's, it's, it's very click it, start it, uh, let someone else worry about it. Um, petabyte scaling means you, you can run custom uh, you can run warehouses from just a few hundred gigs up to petabytes in size. It's huge. And you can alter the size of the warehouse um, as your needs arise. You can grow it, you can shrink it, and because you're paying for that storage space, um, you can get you can keep things very, very cost effective with that. Um, Redshift is tightly integrated with AWS S3 and AWS Analytics, so you can you can query structured and semi-structured data across your data warehouse, your operational database, um, data lake using SQL, and Redshift will let you save the results of your queries back to your S3 data lake. Um, so you can analyze the data with other connected analytics services. Um, Redshift is secure. It has access management, runs uh, under virtual private cloud. You have security groups, um, encryption of the data, SSL for um, your connections and for transport, um, column level access control, it's, it's all built in. Um, Redshift can be deployed, paused, uh, restarted, shut down in, in matters of minutes. So you can use it for short term or long term analytic needs. And it's a great and expensive platform for proof of concept and testing. Um, and Redshift is fast, it is a very fast query uh, performance using columnar storage and data compression, and we'll get into, we'll actually get that into that on the next slide. Um, so the architecture, at the top level, Redshift consists of a leader node and compute node. The leader node communicates with the outside world, um, compiles and optimizes queries from the outside world down to the compute node. The compute node then return results to the leader node to pass back to the re to requester. Um, it's simple in the picture, but a lot's going on in the process. And, and the, one of the biggest things is, uh, is using multi, multi, massively parallel processing or MPP. So those multiple compute nodes handle all the query processing with each core of each node executing the same compiled query segment on portions of the entire data. And um, Redshift uses columnar data storage. So data stored in columns versus rows and this reduces the number of disk io requests and that reduces the amount of data you need to load from the disk makes throughput faster uses data compression reduces storage requirements reducing disk io makes the processing faster um, query optimization so uh, the leader node optimizes the query it's mpp aware and takes advantage of the columnar oriented data storage and optimizes queries for redshift a pretty unique architecture. Um, it also does result cache, caching. So it caches the results of queries in memory on the leader node. And when a user submits a query, it'll check, for the, check the results cache for a cache copy of the query result. And if it finds a match in the result cache, Redshift will use the cached results rather than re-executing the query. So not only is this fast, um, but there's actually no cost for cache pulls, so that was a query you just returned back um, with zero cost. Again, you're always paying for storage, but the cost for actually running uh, the query is, is null. Um, uh, last thing is compiled code distribution. The leader node distributes um, optimized compiled code across all the nodes in a cluster, so it eliminates the overhead associated with an interpreter and it increases the, the execution speed. So um, uh, it's it's very unique. It's very and, and it's very fast. Um, and and while it may look simple, it, it's doing a lot of work to to really pull back petabytes of data very very quickly. Uh, so let's jump to pricing. Um, the great thing about AWS, a lot of times you can test the waters with a free trial, and you can do that with Redshift. I believe uh, you can do two months for free. Do a lot of proof of concept, do a lot of work, do a lot of training on your own. Um, and then you can jump into a pay-as-you-go 
um, level where there's no commitments you can start and stop and you pay 25 cents per hour and then and then uh, any, any storage uh, needs that you would have um, you can then shift to a prepaid reserve model for a discounted rate as low as two cents per hour which is incredible because then you can support an unlimited number of users doing unlimited analytics for one thousand dollars per terabyte per year which is uh, like one tenth the cost of a traditional data warehouse and then with scheduled pause and resumes you can reduce your cost um, by saving compute time um, so when it's paused you're only paying for backup storage and um, you can pause your warehouse for so many hours a day you can only have it available for so many hours a day keep your costs low uh, keep runaway queries from you know running for four days and and with them um, caching, you can really reduce your cost um, if, if you get creative with, with the caching and, and, and you're not you know, pulling directly from, from the, uh, the compute node. So quick summary, because we want to get to our Q&A. Um, <clears throat> starting with AWS Glue, it's managed ETL service to prepare and load data for analytics. It's serverless. You don't have to provision infrastructure. It generates automatic code, and again, you're only paying for what you use when it runs what you need. Um, Redshift allows you to automate most of the common administrative tasks to manage, monitor, and scale your data warehouse. It's cost-effective and low risk. Uh, delivers fast performance by using MPP, columnar storage technology, all the other things we talked about to improve IO efficiency. And it resizes, it can resize dynamically as your performance in, and capacity needs change, or you can control that manually. So we wanted to run through this quickly because we wanted to get to Q&A, um, but, but Glue and Redshift are truly our key components of a, a complete AWS cloud analytics platform. Um, if you're looking to get into this, if you're starting out, if you're in the middle of the process, if you have any questions, we'd love to help you get there. We do offer one-on-one -on -one sessions. I believe you can find a link to that on our website. Um, but let's turn it over to uh, Q&A. All right. Thank you, Dean. Um, the first question we have is, um, is what is a glue crawler? All right. I'll, I'll take that. Uh, yep. So glue crawlers are like uh, they, when you connect to our database, or a data store, it uh, crawls progressively and uh, goes through your various tables and the schema definitions that you have and brings it and aggregates into a central repository, which is a metadata repository. Uh, and it stores that you can do it one time or like uh, you can schedule those kind to run it on multiple times on a schedule so that uh, whenever there are any changes, it the group glue crawler can uh, crawl your data stores and bring the latest definitions, any table changes, and exposes any new data that it has. So it's a very good feature on the data cataloging, and this helps to expose uh, it to other services like you saw in the use cases. Thank you. Um, the next question is a Redshift question. Um, is the table structure for a warehouse different in Redshift as compared to standard databases? Um, so the optimized structure that Redshift has is, yes, but you can you can run Redshift on, on top of very wide flat data. You can run Redshift on a typical star schema. Um, and, and actually you can migrate, you could migrate your existing warehouse as it is right now, say it's a very Kimball kind of uh, warehouse. You could put it into Redshift. And there's actually a tool that, uh, that uh, helps you do migrations like that. It'll migrate what it can, um, say you're coming from Oracle or whatever. It'll migrate what it can. If it has trouble with something, it'll mark it. You might have to do some things manually. There are some differences in terms of like Redshift doesn't like support um, uh, like surrogate keys directly. So you'd have to work with that in Glue. Um, but, um, and, and again, because it's Columna, it's, it's actually almost taking the data 
that you would have in a wide file in a wide uh, table and and almost making it somewhat dimensional. So it does work with both. I think I think what you what people would typically do is they'd migrate what they have or migrate their own thinking of of how they typically approach a data warehouse into Redshift, and as they develop within it, uh, find ways to to tweak things and. and kind of fit better the data compression and the columnar uh, approach that it takes. Excellent. Yeah, I think you actually answered another question as well. So we can, we can check that one off about okay. the process of migrating from an existing warehouse to Redshift. Um, next question is on the glue side. Um, why do you need uh, DMS and glue? Um, I think that was in the initial architecture diagram. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so um, yeah, it is like we analyze uh, what is the business case. We analyze the, in your environment, and it's not like we are saying or recommending that we have to use DMS. But like in the typical implementations that we have seen, DMS because it has the as the feature to migrate your whole database and move it onto the cloud on AWS, it is a very good feature or a very good service that you can migrate your whole database in one full soup. And also it has another feature wherein it, uh, it allows you to detect changes. So only the incremental data can be, uh, can be loaded into your, into your uh, next storage or database that you have. So those two features kind of have, or that's just put in the diagram to show you that there is a capability when you are uh, loading your entire database, uh, DMS is a good feature to have or good service to have. But whereas AWS Glue can kind of handle most of the other ETL needs that is there for a typical data warehouse. So that's why just for a diagram, like we showed a classical architecture implementation, that's why the DMS is there. Oh, thank you. I think we have time for mm -hmm. one more question. Um, do you have to use Redshift and Glue together? No, you, you, you don't. You don't have to use either one. Now, they're certainly optimized for each other. And I'm sorry, Amazon would love it if you use them both, but you, I imagine it would be a daunting task to move everything that you might already have, um, your ETL and and your actual storage at one at one time. So you, know, you wouldn't have to, uh, you wouldn't have to do that. Um, I, I don't know necessarily. I think maybe I'd do Redshift first and then do Glue because you can use, you know, say you're running Informatica, you can um, uh, you can use uh, Redshift with Informatica, no problem. I don't know if you want to add it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like I was going to say the same. And uh, like uh, one, one other feature of Glue, which I mean, I'm not a big fan of is like in typical ETL tools, you find that it has a nice UI feature, which is very simple for, uh, for rapid development. And uh, it helps you to move data and connect the data sources. and which Glue does not. It uh, generates the code in Scala or Python. So you have to have some familiarity with those environments and code in order to use Glue. So it's not uh, very kind of uh, good in that feature. So, and we also have implementation experience with other cloud, uh, cloud vendors like Matillion Informatica, and it can be used to load data as uh, alternative for ETL. So definitely we would recommend based on uh, your needs, but we have also seen like organizations sometimes wants to keep uh, within AWS stack and would like to go with Glue. So we have also implemented Glue in those cases. Yeah, there's definitely different scenarios for different uh, different people. So, all right, we've hit the end of the half hour. If you could go to the next slide, Dipankar. Um, Thanks everyone for yep. attending. Just a quick list of upcoming talks. Tomorrow we've got um, Cloud BI technology comparison, and then another couple of weeks of data scientist, data advisor, and BI expert. 
And also, if you go to our website um, and go to the Take 30 section, there's the you can click on a link and schedule a one-on-one -on -one session if you want to talk to a BI expert, a data advisor, or a data scientist directly for uh, 20 minutes about a specific question. Uh, we'd love to talk to you. So thanks very much, everyone, and, and have a good rest of your day.